Hi, good morning and good afternoon, depending on what part of the state you guys are. Sorry about the um, delays. We're just having technical difficulties. But um, thank you everyone for being here with us. We have great, uh, quite the panelist here, very distinguished guests here. But first I would like to introduce our amazing sponsor who is helping uh, Mazda make this webinar happen. And right now we have Mr. Rico Garcia with the O'Hanlon, Demereth and Castillo firm. Rico. Hello, hi, I'm Rico Garcia. I'm an attorney with uh, the law firm of uh, O'Hanlon, Demereth and Castillo. We are, uh, in short, we're a school law firm. We represent um, clients all over the place and we're very proud to do so. Um, I'm here in the Rio Grande Valley at the moment. Our headquarters is over in Austin, Texas where uh, Mr. O'Hanlon himself is and I think we'll be able to log on a little bit. Um, I'm honored to join the firm. I've had the opportunity to have worked with uh, both Representative Gonzalez and Senator Menendez in my capacity as a, as a staffer in the past. And I, you know, they're, they're incredible. Uh, and the firm I'm with is, is a lot of folks that have all kinds of uh, experience. Kevin himself used to be the general counsel of the PEA. Uh, ben Castillo used to be a board president when he was 18 or 19. Um, you know, everyone has kind of these, these uh, unique forms of experiences, but our main thing is we just have years and years of experience representing school districts and. Um, that's our biggest thing. We, we have been able to help and support uh, largely uh, Latinos and you know in, in this space, doing all kinds of work uh, in both you know education, uh, political sphere, and everywhere else. So um, I won't take too much more time. Uh, I will let the, give the floor back to you, Ms. Cortez. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Rico, and all the great work you're doing across Central Texas uh, representing our public schools. Yeah. So I really do appreciate that. So um, before we begin, uh, I know we're we're having a 10 week uh, webinar series. So all of our attended, all our attendees and uh, member Mazba districts will be receiving CEC -E -C -C credits. So um, just once we're done, we will be sending all those to our attendees. Uh, we will now introduce our uh, guest our first guest that we have here would be uh, Senator Jose Menendez. And um, take it off, Senator. Thank you so much for being here with us. Hey, thank you very much for having me, Anna and, and team. And uh, I, I want to thank everyone for joining us. Uh, what a pleasure and an honor to be with all of you. And especially with my colleague, Representative Mary E. Gonzalez, who is a superstar in the Texas House. And a tremendous leader on the national level as well as a co-chair of uh, the uh, gosh what do we call the the what, the, what is it the, the board of oh Hispanic caucus chairs board of Hispanic <laughs> caucus chairs yes thank you so much uh, I want to commend Masaba Mas Bap for putting together this informational webinar series on education equity and for remaining engaged in these very difficult and important issues in our public schools that our students uh, in particular, are facing on a day-to-day -day basis. It goes without saying that this this darn pandemic has overwhelmed uh, many parts of our society, namely our health system. Uh, but our public schools have paid a price, as well as our economy. And we all know that uh, disproportionately, it's impacting people of color. Um, I think it's our public school administrators and our teachers who have tried to do an extraordinary job to continue with their mission of educating and caring for our children. Uh, and from the start. I think you've all done what you could to respond to this crisis by assembling uh, food drives uh, and, and lines in the early weeks of the pandemic so that our kids wouldn't go hungry to acquiring and distributing technology uh, so that the kids wouldn't have a bigger uh, COVID learning slide or gap. Um, I, I, I want to thank you for your tremendous work that you've done. I'm also, and I want you to know that um, you are uh, reminded so many who have been in doubt of how incredible and how necessary our public schools are, how much a part of the, the weave, the fabric of our community. And so that's why this session, I, I'm very, very honored and excited to be a member of the Senate Education Committee uh, to work on these issues. And so I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Uh, many of you, uh, you all know that, that the state of Texas was looking at a very difficult budget, uh, fortunately, uh, the last uh, budget uh, forecast that we received uh, was uh, had a nice surprise. Instead of being $4.6 billion short, we're only about $900 million short. 
Uh, that still is a lot. But the good news is that when the comptroller announced a few weeks ago that we're going to have about $112 billion available in available funds for the next budget, it doesn't mean we'll have as many, but the shortfall wasn't as bad. And, and what that did, it helped uh, embolden many of us to ask that there would be no way to go back on HB2. And so uh, we have gotten commitments from people in, in positions where there are going to be some decision-making positions and positions the the chairs and other leaders on the, in, the, in the state that we will not fall back on our commitments. And so that way, even though the events of the last few years have demonstrated the needs uh, that we have to, how Texas needs to diversify its funding streams, I, I think you all believe that and know that COVID relief is gonna be a, a tremendous issue that we have to deal with. Many of our school districts have made tremendous unexpected purchases, many of which you have not been reimbursed for. School districts have had to pay out of their own funds uh, last spring to provide laptops, iPads, hotspots, uh, and other ways to keep in touch with your students. And before opening in the fall, many schools had to upgrade your HVAC systems. You know, many of our older school buildings didn't have filtration systems that could keep up with this virus or others. And all of those costs, none of them were anticipated. And so we know we need to now, as lawmakers, is to give you the support that you need to meet these big challenges. So um, I know last session we had the political will to make the major changes to our public education system. And I misspoke earlier, I called it HB2, it's HB3. And we know that in HB3, we added roughly six and a half billion dollars in new money uh, to the state for pre-K through 12 education. And it came with many costly mandates. And this session, we have to keep up with funding of those mandates. We cannot delay tackling other inequities, such as the digital divide, um, the glaringly apparent, that's glaringly apparent in rural and urban core communities. Um, and we need to reinforce the advancements that were made last session by providing students with more social and emotional support. I think the time has come that we have a social emotional counselor in every single school. And, and we really need to look at uh, adding mental health education in our high schools at a minimum. Over the last 10 years, we've been in a collective crisis mode and our students and educators have been feeling it so intensely, especially so many students who've had to make that decision of whether they go to work uh, and potentially risk their health or that of their loved ones. And so this is why we have got to address so many of the things that TA is doing, starting, and in my opinion, with the accountability system, which is I think needs to be thrown out and we can need, we can restart. Um, we should figure out, be able to figure out how to measure student progress without, and use the data to address needs of improvement, not use it as a punitive thing, not use it as something to hurt people. And especially in these times, I don't know how you, it makes any sense to require that students come back in or in person, end of course exams or STAR, and then rate teachers and students and campuses while they've all been virtual, well, for the most part, or half and half, it's ridiculous. Uh, I, I just, we need to ask ourselves, do we want our children to still learn and stay engaged in their education? Absolutely. But we can hold our students and teachers to a higher standard and collect information that will actually help them. We have a responsibility to the five and a half million Texas public school students to bridge the gap between them. We also have a, a very tall order, and that's to bolster the system that can uplift young learners from very challenging circumstances. Bridging the achievement gap among the 60% of students who are economically disadvantaged, the 20.3% who have been identified as ELLs or English language learners the 10% who receive special education services, and the 7.6 who've been identified as homeless. So my ask of you is please continue your advocacy. It's gonna be critical this session. And as you know, uh, access is gonna be restricted more so than normal at the Capitol, uh, but I need you to organize. I want you to use the technology that you have to keep each other informed, to strategize, to mobilize, to get your communities involved and engaged. 
And I want you to know that you're all welcome to reach out to me and my staff. Uh, we've decided to have a weekly Zoom open Q&A, sort of a town hall, uh, every Thursday at 5.30. Please feel free to drop in. Uh, you have invited very knowledgeable and hardworking advocates to share their insights, and I'm confident that there are going to be some very rich and productive discussions. So just know this, I look forward to continuing to work with you and to be a part of all the advances that we work on, in particular for all of those young people that are depending on us and their families. Muchas gracias por todo. Yo sé que juntos hacemos la diferencia. Together, we will make a difference. Unidos hacemos la fuerza. Es todo. Sí se puede. Sí se puede. Muchas gracias, Senator Jose Menendez. We really appreciate you being here with us. Um, geez, you touched on almost everything we had. It's kind of, it's nice to know that we're, you know, now just 900 million shortfall, better than the billions that you mentioned earlier. But I do appreciate all your advocacy and everything you're doing. And, um, uh, you know, whatever else we, whatever other information that you can provide us, how we can better advocate for our public education uh, students, we'd love to to hear from you too as well. And we'll be here um, advocating. And thank you for being with MASBA as well. Okay, see, Anna, the one thing I didn't say that that I think for me is critical in, 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 in how I approach things. Yo soy un hijo de dos inmigrantes que llegaron a este país sin nada. Entonces, it was it was my education la educación que, que Dios y la escuela nos dio y mis padres nos inculcaron that's the only reason claro I'm here sí. la única razón que mi hermana está donde está estamos por nuestra educación because of that and and I know that if if many of us have had and shared this story we can be wherever we are so many other kids can too so it's up to us to make sure that they understand the potential that they have and that we don't let them down Exactly. Yeah, my parents used to say, este, lo único, lo que no te van a quitar es la educación, es tu tesoro, it's your treasure. That's the only thing no one can take away from you. So, no, thank you very much once again. State Rep, Mary Gonzalez, thank you for being here. Oh, I'm super excited to be here with you all today and with the senator who I just admire and love so much. Um, so I'm just going to do some quick intro remarks and I think we're going to do Q&A. Is that correct, Anna? We're going to welcome the other panelists. We have another, we have about four different panelists that will be uh, welcoming, welcoming uh, in the in the webinar. Wonderful. So first and foremost, I see some of my district folks, uh, Sandra, uh, Veronica, Jeannie, like so great to see everybody, but um, just really honored to be here. Every session, we know that education is one of the most critical things we do on these 140 days. But this session, um, that is so much, it is so much more crucial, not only because of the things that the senator discussed, like the budget, um, the coronavirus, vaccines for teachers and students, etc., but also the fact that we have um, 5.4 million kids in our schools right now, and 4 million of them have um, experienced severe learning loss. So what does that mean? What do we do as a state to, for those giant numbers in order to address them? And for me, that's one of the most critical questions that we need to be giving our school districts and our school leaders the resources to really overcome what could be a generational problem for the future of our state if it isn't addressed appropriately or adequately. The problem is, is that, and we all know and experience this, is that COVID has um, really impacted our communities um, specifically our communities of color at a greater disparity than any of our other communities. And because of that, the, the regular ways in which we have addressed, um, whether it's school funding or resources or even access to programs cannot be the way we continue to do it. I'll give an example. In our, in our community, we have experienced, um, and I'm sure a lot of your communities have experienced, that not only is the digital divide significant, Right, we have that problem across the state. But we've, what we've seen in families is a lot of the technology we ask kids to use at home is only in English, right? So what happens when you have a bilingual family um, and you have parents who are helping co-teach their kids but don't have the same access to the resources that we're giving them? Um, and so we just really need to be critical and thoughtful about 
what are we doing? Is it accessible? Is it inclusive? Is it representative of a diverse state? And how can we make sure specifically that we are addressing the fact that we have a a very serious issue of learning loss for millions, not just a couple or a thousand. We're talking about four million kids, 70% of our kids who are below grade level. And so that is gonna be something that we um, address this session and I'm hopeful that we can think critically as partners about how we can do that. I want you to know that I'm here this morning to speak to you all because I really appreciate the role that you play in the advocacy of the Capitol. A lot of times, um, our communities can get left out and as hard as we try, I'll give an example. Um, last session of the Public Education Committee, even though Latinos are a significant portion of our K through 12 system, there was only two Latinos on the committee, myself and Diego Bernal. That's it, they represent all of our community. So we need you um, now more than ever to be a voice because we know ex firsthand how this last year has, ex has been for our community. For El Paso specifically, and for Latinos in Texas, we end, We started last school year a week after the shooting where someone came to our community um, to kill brown people. That, while it's been traumatic for our community, has really been traumatic across the state as a target, targeted racial violence. And so um, thinking through not only COVID, but the shooting, then COVID and now going into this year with budget realities, we just have the responsibility we share as a collective is significant and huge. And I'm here because I want to continue to be your partner with the Senator and with all the advocates because we only have 140 days to do this for the next two years. It's, it's so much work to do in such a short period of time. It means nobody's sleeping anymore. Hope everybody has an addiction to coffee like I do um, and Red Bull. But this, oh, there you go, Senator. But this is this because this is our moment. This is our moment to create the change that I see, yes, Anna, that we need. And so um, I'm here as your partner, as your ally, as your friend, and in solidarity to work together. So thank you for inviting me. Well, thank you so much, State Rep. Uh, Gonzalez, for all your words. And we do have uh, a quite a few people joining us here as well. Um, what I'm what I'm going to ask of all our panelists, if you can please turn on your your cameras so we can start introducing all our pan panelists. Thank you. OK, so right now. We have um, Luis Figueroa of Every Texan. We have Dax Gonzalez of TASB. Uh, Fatima Menendez of Mouth Deaf and Mitokaya Ana Ramon of IDRA. So what I'm going to do, if, if you guys can uh, please introduce yourself, uh, give a brief uh, introduction, and then we have a few questions that we'd like to ask you. Who would like to go first? Well, I'm happy to start. Uh, I wanted to uh, give a thanks and a welcome to Senator Menendez and Representative Gonzalez, who uh, represent my my two homes, uh, my birthplace, El Paso and Mary, and, and where I went to college and worked for a long time uh, at the Mexican American Legal Defense Fund. Uh, Senator Menendez represents San Antonio. Uh, my name is Luis Figueroa. I'm the Legislative and Policy Director for Every Texan, formerly the Center for Public Policy Priorities. And we work uh, to ensure that every Texan um, has the ability to be financially secure, well-educated, uh, and healthy. Um, and that is our mission. And, and I'm so glad to be here. And, and thank you for doing, for having me join this esteemed panel with, with these amazing panelists. Uh, I'll just go next. Uh, so my name is Dox Gonzalez. I am the Division Director of TASB Governmental Relations. Uh, we represent every uh, school board out there, uh, school district across the state. Uh, and um, we're just here to support you all and and uh, and continue advocacy on y'all's behalf. Thank you, guys. Hi, Ms. my name is Hi. yes. <laughs> uh, my name is Anna Ramon. I'm the deputy director of advocacy at IDRA. Uh, really excited to join this wonderful panel and see such amazing. Uh, public education leaders with us today. Uh, I'm at IDRA or IDRA, I guess in another, another type of pronunciation. We really focus on making sure that children have ac equal access to education and are prepared for college and college readiness. And we're really excited to also have a multi-prong approach where we provide education practice, research, and policy in action. Thank you for having me. Thank you. 
Fatima. Hi. It's so nice to see y'all. I figured it out. I, it, was a, it was a scramble, but I'm here. Um, hi, I'm Fatima Menendez. I'm a legislative attorney with MALDEF, the Mexican American Legal Defense and Educational Fund. We are a nonprofit law firm that works to protect the civil rights of Latinos throughout the country and in Texas. Um, we have an office in San Antonio that covers states in the Southwest region. So this office covers Texas. Um, and we affect change through litigation, policy work, advocacy, community, education. Um, and we work in four main areas, which is uh, education, employment, immigrants' rights, and voting rights. So I'm excited to be here with all of you, some of my favorite people and advocates. So thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Fatima, for joining Mazva. And um, we do have a few questions that we'd like to see. You know, you can just jump in. Um, one of the questions that we want to know is uh, the most pressing issues. So about your organization, what are the most pressing issues rela related to public education that you and your organization are following through this 87th legislative session? And um, feel free to whoever wants to go first. Well, I'll start on the budget. You know, I think first and foremost, the legislature has to do a budget. It's the one constitutional required thing. I really appreciate Senator Menendez and Mary uh, and Representative Mary Gonzalez starting with the budget and the importance um, of that. We, you know, last session, thanks to the leadership of, of a lot of legislators, including Representative Gonzalez, we put in an $11.5 billion investment in education last session. Um, now, all of that is not going to education about Six uh, billion of it is going actually into the classroom and helping to improve and enrich our educational experience for all of our students across Texas. But five and a half billion is going towards what's called tax compression. Um, and it is going to be difficult to keep that funding levels up um, session after session, particularly as property values rise um, and the tax compression sets in and the state's gonna have to make up the difference for these school districts. Um, so for us, it starts with the budget and coming up with revenue options, uh, ways to sustain that education for education, um, because we have never fully funded the needs of our students, and particularly the ones that need it the most, the English language learners, the economically disadvantaged mm -hmm. students, the students with disabilities. Um, so that's where it starts with us. Uh, one thing that we are looking for this particular session is what some people are calling a hold harmless, which is basically just ensuring that students um, that um, have been lost um, because of the pandemic um, aren't, um, are, you know, aren't going to take a financial hit um, because of the lack of attendance or the less, uh, lack of enrollment. Uh, we think this is a, a good opportunity to talk about funding schools on enrollment. Um, Rep, uh, Representative Gina Hinojosa has a bill, House Bill 1246, that would do that permanently. Um, we'd love to have a conversation about that long term. Um, but ultimately, it comes down to funding kids and funding the kids that need it the most. So we uh, that's where we start, and, and we appreciate all the leaders uh, working for that. Well, thank all you, right. Mr. Figueroa. I really like the hold harmless um, issue. And I know even our district, my superintendent, uh, was it's a top priority as well. And of course, we have two elected officials here. They could always chime in and, and answer any of these uh, pressing issues that our um, other panelists are working on. Thank you. I, 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 I'll, I'll be happy to chime in, but I'd love to hear from the other members as well. Okay. So, um, Dax Gonzalez, you're working with TASB. Can you tell us um, your priorities yeah. right now? Yeah, so the whole harmless is a really big deal. And the way that we're looking at it is we don't want a short term crisis to have long term impacts on our schools because if schools are, are short funded this session, uh, you know, this coming biennium, because of um, kids that aren't there right now, um, you're talking about cutting programs and staff that need to be there when kids come back after the pandemic. And so we want to make sure that those kids are, are, um, are accounted for um, in the future. Uh, but um, something important to know about the budget is while um, public schools were funded, the FSP, the Foundation School Program, was funded, fully funded in the budget, they're using a lower enrollment number for kids coming into the system. Uh, they're, traditionally we have between 70 and 80,000 kids that come in uh, over the biennium, and I think they're, they're projecting between like 35 and 40,000 kids. So um, if the pandemic were to end and everyone came back at the same, you know, um, at the same time, uh, that could be 
uh, an increase we don't know that that's just another one of the crystal ball issues that that we can't we can't predict right now but that's just something to be aware of as, as something that could potentially be an issue um and then you know we, we talked about the digital divide um districts have been yeah. really good about getting technology out to their kids but the access needed the broadband needed to, to use that technology is still a big issue and even some districts that are, are providing hotspots to their kids uh, their kids live in in areas that are not um, accessible to the and the hotspots don't work and I'm sure I'm sure Representative Gonzalez is very familiar with that um, but you know uh, people in East Texas too I mean all over the state you have people that um, that kids cannot access um, uh, their, their hotspots don't have um, access so um, so that's something that we definitely need to look into um, but uh, those are some of the bigger the bigger things we're looking at you know standardized tests uh, the the delay the the pausing of A through F is certainly um, welcome news but having to take standardized tests in person is going to be a big deal um you know a lot of our kids are already stressed out and, and putting on another state test on top is, is maybe not the best thing right now our teachers know where our kids are um, in terms of their educational journeys um a state test isn't necessarily going to tell the teachers more than what they already know so um you know we could we could certainly um we, we would hope for uh, maybe a, a a voluntary uh, administration of tests where districts that needed that assessment, those diagnostic assessments, could could use that. But um, it's a it's a tough ask for a, a, an education system that's already under a lot of pressure. Thank you, thank you, Dax. Um, so, Fatima, I mean, I think, okay, go ahead, Mr. Uh, Senator I just, Menendez. I just want to briefly say something about the standardized test because I mean. You know, I don't have a lot of regrets. One of the regrets I have, though, is not talking to my parents into letting me go to law school. But uh, since we have, uh, uh, you know, uh, Fatima and, and Maldef, I mean, the question that I would say is, is why not? I think, and maybe it's the resources, but I think that suing the TA uh, to not have us have kids come in to do in-person uh, standardized testing would not be a would be a good use of resources, and I think it would be, I think it would be, very uh, justified. And I, f I'm I'm very frustrated because I just don't see during this COVID pandemic, especially with the the tsunami that's going to hit here soon. Um, why are we going to bring kids into a, a confined space and teachers and other people? Uh, for what reason? What is the what is the greater good or gain that we're going to come that's going to come out of this? I mean, even if we could get an injunction, that I don't know. I just these are, you know, this is why I need to go to law school so I can learn. Maybe I'm not saying things the right way, and maybe I don't know what I'm saying, but I I'm just upset about the whole situation. So that's all I had to say about that. And, and can I add the complexity from our community is that Latinos are disproportionately impacted by COVID, right? So when we see like these jarring numbers from the recent HHSC report, where it's talking about, um, you know, 49% of the people impacted by COVID are, are Latinos, right? And so knowing these numbers, and so I know it's really complex. On some level, we're thinking about equity, right? That's a topic of our conversation. We need to know where our people, where our students are at. So testing them makes yeah. sense. But also recognizing the complexity of teacher trauma, student trauma, parent trauma, in a moment where um, we are in a global pandemic, maybe this trying to be nuanced about trying to get the information we need without inflicting further trauma is critical. So um, thank you for your words, Senator Menendez and uh, State Rep Gonzalez. So I'm going to now piggyback on what Senator Menendez said, uh, Fatima, with the legal defense. What are your thoughts, <laughs> I mean, so, you know, pursuing some kind of legal action against TEA? I mean, it sounds like a lot of people are frustrated. We're all, well, we're I'm all. We, we are all very frustrated. No, um, Senator Menendez is spot on um, and Representative Gonzalez is also. Um, we know that it's an issue that disproportionately affects Latino students of color, um, children that come from low income neighborhoods. And this is an issue that we've been following really closely, not just as MALDEF, but also as a co-administrator of the Texas Latino Education Equity Coalition, which we co-administer with 
um, Anna and Dr. Chloe Sykes at IDRA. Um, so we know that, uh, you know, it's an issue that has been on the radar for our members of TLEAC for a long time. We've been following it closely. We've had conversations with TEA about it. Um, I can't reveal any, um, you know, litigation that may or may not be um, happening or that we are considering at the moment, but I can let you know that it's something that we are following closely. Um, and it leads me into some of the, the priorities that we have for this legislative session and really thinking about, um, you know, high stakes standardized testing. We know that it's been harmful, like we said, to Latino students of color um, at a disproportionate rate. Um, Texas requires more states than are federally required by the Every Student Succeeds Act. So something that we've pushed for in previous legislative sessions is eliminating those additional tests that, um, you know, are more than what is federally required. We also know that there's a need for holistic assessments. Um, we've seen that, you know, we're encountering these issues of safety and students' health and teachers' health and administering these tests. Um, and so, you know, if if there are students or family members who have been, um, you know, impacted by COVID-19, they have somebody sick in the household or they're not going to be able to take the, you know, the test or whatever it is, any end of course assessments as we continue to see how the pandemic unfolds. Um, you know, we need to think about more holistic assessments and making sure that we are still advocating for students to be able to receive a high school diploma and to be able to be promoted, um, you know, to their next grade level and not just relying on these high stakes standardized testing. Something that we advocated for last legislative session and we'll continue to advocate this session is the need for individual graduation committees. Um, that is something that has a sunset provision in it for 2023. Um, and so there is a bill that's been filed by Senator Seliger um, that would uh, get rid of that, um, you know, expiration date for individual graduation committees. There's also a bill that's been filed by Representative Bernal that says that individual graduation committees would be able to, um, you know, would be able to approve a student's graduation from high school um, without consideration of how they did on any end of course assessments. Um, and so that would be for this school year, next school year, and the school year of 2022 to 2023. Um, so, you know, we are looking at the issue of the star test of having students go in to take it. And then we're also looking at additional avenues where we can continue to advocate for effective holistic assessments where we hopefully don't have to encounter these problems again. Great information, Fatima. Thank you so much. Um, uh, Ana Ramon. <laughs> so uh there are we've touched on a lot i feel like i should just be joint authoring all of these statements um some of our <laughs> some of our main focuses at idra not and t like which thank you for laying that out uh fatima that i'll tell y'all that was a labor of love we probably had at least four to six hours worth of meetings with our coalition just to really work out like what are the the details and the needs when it comes to that level of assessment and accountability and some of the concerns that are not even just COVID related, but are translating over multiple sessions and multiple years. So outside of that, you know, we're really concerned about what a state broadband plan looks like for both rural and urban communities. You know, we've looked at the state broadband bills, which is a, a major trend in legislation, at least education wise, that we're wanting to follow. None of them explicitly talk about education and how it will be kind of looped into that conversation so we want to make sure that when we're talking about broadband plans that education is explicitly mentioned especially for students across needs and across um, equity and what those concerns look like especially for emergent bilingual students uh, students with disabilities uh, students from low-income families students of color across k-12 and higher education um, we're also you know, again, going back to what Luis was mentioning, we have a lot of uh, interest in what's going on when it comes to school finance, right? Some interesting things to note, only one in five emergent bilingual or English learner students are served in a dual language program. So there's still concerns and interest about what it looks like to increase, this is a wish of wish, right? Allotments for our emergent bilingual students and also the needs of our students who receive uh, special education services. Over 10% of students receive those kinds of services from you in the ISDs. So those are things that we're wanting to make sure we're tracking. And I, I think I, we again join author a lot of the conversations when it comes to enrollment. I think there's some mention of, uh, you know, the enrollment gap as 
pertains to the actual number of students in the district and maybe a 3%, I think, number has been thrown around and what that will look like. And, uh, you know, we've heard from ISDs, like I believe it was Corpus Christi ISD on a, on a previous uh, conversation who mentioned that there could be a loss of $1.5 million if there wasn't a hold harmless in place. So it really lays out some of our concerns. And to Representative Gonzalez's point, when it comes to the trauma that's been inflicted by this and the needs of our students, but also their families, that is a major, major concern of us. We uh, conducted a study of uh, students in San Antonio area. We surveyed 120 students. The, student, the survey was built by students, uh, distributed by students, and then helped um, to be actually analyzed by students. And over 75% of the students mentioned that they were suffering some, from some kind of healthcare issue or mental health care issue and that it was exasperated by COVID-19. Um, and I'll just to share, uh, you know, a part of the San Antonio Reopening Coalition that we work with, it's, um, it's not, a day doesn't go by when we're not at a meeting when we talk about a, a student or that's impacted by COVID or by a a teacher that's been lost to COVID. So it's it's creating these layers of issues that are part of that conversation when it comes to equity and now is just being driven more and more apart uh, by this uh, terrible crisis we're, we're dealing with. So join authoring a lot of what was said and um, looking forward to this continued conversation around these really necessary uh, issues to be taken up by the legislature. Wonderful. Thank you, Anna. Um, right now, I, I know we're we're falling a little bit behind on time, but we, we're good. I wanted to see if there was any questions that anybody had. Feel free to type them in. And then, Jamie, if I'm not able to see them, just let me know. But let me jump into the next um, kind of question that, that we, we had. A lot of our viewers are superintendents and school board and, you know, a lot of people in public education. So one of the biggest, uh, one of the things that we want, what are the, one of the things that our superintendents and school boards need to know about the 87th legislative session, the state of, um, the present state of Texas, and, you know, any other uh, sentiments of what is going on in the, leg in this 87th legislative session? Well, if, if, if I could just um, uh, talk about one thing that I think is really important for our um, our school leaders to be talking to their legislators about um, is uh, the efforts that they're going to to find students that aren't currently in school. And because what we're hearing a lot from legislative yeah. leadership as recently as last week from Chairman Taylor was that um, a lot of these decisions about funding and um, and hold harmless are going to be made um against the backdrop of of the efforts school districts are making to bring back all of those kids that they aren't currently um serving or they, they can't get in touch with or, or aren't engaging so um that is really important because it, it's it's something that um is going to go a long way towards making sure that we have that hold harmless i know y'all are doing it i know y'all are doing it out there <laughs> i know y'all are going door to door and, and for trying, but you need to reach me your legislators <laughs> Um, if I could chime in, we wholeheartedly agree. Uh, we've been looking at April 2020 data, again, some preliminary information around some of the, the criteria is that there's emergency PEAM codes or crisis codes that have been created. And in our initial look, you know, it looks like districts serving larger populations of black and brown students of color demonstrate the highest rates of no or lost engagement, as it's been um, termed by TA. And these are major concerns for us. And But we know, like talking to ISDs in this emergency response, but also with like the Texas Counselors Association, often tasked with also trying to find these untraceable students, how difficult it is. And it, obviously it being exasperated by the digital divide and, you know, funding concerns and just the general, you know, uh, issues that people deal with day to day and the conversations we have with our families and students that we work with in coalition. So, um, and also just to kind of highlight this does, what we're seeing also in this initial data from again, April, 2020. So it's really soon after um, the initial COVID-19 uh, shutdowns, but that also represents a mix of uh, rural and urban districts. And um, it appears that districts demonstrating high rates of no or lost engagement are more representative of rural 
town districts, and that's coming from NCES descriptions. So that we are going to be releasing a more holistic report once this is done. And I want to give the caveat: this these are just our preliminary looks, and we also are requesting data from this last fall to make sure that we have a full year's look heading into the legislature, but let, let, heading into our legislative discussions about this issue of untraceable students. So thank you, uh, Ana Ramon. I do have two questions coming in from um, uh, from our webinar. We have one from Lourdes Davenport, and uh, it says, how can we as bilingual families contribute to the success of our children in schools when their parents cannot assist them at home? Can we put a call out to other family members to assist? The schools cannot be the only ones who can carry the responsibility for this. Are there online tutoring services available for kids? I guess this just goes back to the different resources we're trying to um, advocate for. And, okay. No, uh, Does, and I'm, ha I'm happy to chime in. We um, have conducted a few what we call Mesa Comunitarias or tables where we bring in uh, families who speak only prim primarily Spanish. We work really heavily with a group called Arise in the Valley, who's part of the TILA coalition, because you, they are serving mainly bilingual families. So I think connecting with your legislators like Senator Menendez and Re Representative Gonzalez about your needs and what you're seeing in the district is so impactful because we need both the data, but also the human element and how families are being unfortunately impacted by COVID-19 is so crucial. And then another project that we've been working on, if you have early um, early bilingual uh, students or your, your K, uh, before K and what that looks like, we're also working with Texans Care for Children and philanthropy advocates on what is a bilingual roadmap and trying to bring in a lot of conversations when it comes to the impacts of bilingual families and what that looks like. So please see us in IDRA and Fatima at MALDEF and I think all of us really as resources on this because it's so crucial to that learning loss and what our fears are when it comes to bilingual families, which was already existing and now exasperated with COVID. So some of us are working in that um, holistically and we are, our, our mission is to make sure that we're uplifting those voices into the legislature. So Ana, a question. When you guys have those mesas comunitarias, I think we just lost Ana. Oh, I'm back. Sorry, oh, she's there. <laughs> when you have those mesas comunitarias, those conversations, I'm assuming you're doing these virtually right now because of COVID and all that. So yes. Do you ever have an opportunity to invite, uh, I don't know, just a five, ten minute guest speaker or something to the to to talk to the parents for a sec? So if yes. you do, um, be, you know, please put me on a list. If there's a list, you know, you know, I was born in San Juan and in Valle, and you know, um, two two parents que muy apenas sabían por dónde. Nomás en la escuela mandalo por acá y y cuando llegué no había hablado inglés y the teachers get, sit him down in front of PBS Channel 9. He, uh, you know, it was Mr. Rogers, Captain Kangaroo, Sesame Street, who taught me English. So, but <laughs> the reason is, para que no se sientan solos, que se sientan que hay esperanzas, que hay, que todos mm -hmm. sus hijos también pueden y nomás que le pongan ganas y, y que estamos aquí para esperarlos, para ayudarles. So, yeah, please count me in on that, on that, on those efforts, please. Absolutely. And the last thing I'll mention is uh, we also are building out a program for family advocates. So if there's any members on this call who are interested in becoming a family advocate, whether it be early bilingual or otherwise, we would love to be in touch with you and get you in touch with our policy and community engagement team. And, and thank you for the generous offer, Senator Menendez. These, these have been regional communitarias. So if any legislator is interested, we want to make sure that we, you have access to um, our individuals who are working on this as well. I'm really excited to share that with our team. Absolutely. Wonderful. Thank you, guys. Um, did you want to, uh, did I interrupt you, Senator Menendez? Mm -hmm. No, no, I would love everything so I'm here, gonna... and I just, I just want to be an advocate. I want to help however I can. Claro que si, claro que si. Um, it reminds me, too, I was, uh, my first language was Spanish. I was in the, you know, in East Texas, and it was really, really hard to you you were not allowed to speak Spanish in the school, so it was very hard for for students like that don't have those resources. But um, here, let me go to the second question uh, from Trustee Nedra Robinson. She wants to know how can we recruit teachers from Spanish speaking countries to fill the teaching gap. My campus currently needs a pre K kinder and fourth grade dual language teacher. Unfortunately, the students aren't receiving the appropriate 
services because we don't have a certified teacher. Um, so I can jump in on this and, oh, I'm sorry, somebody else. Did I interrupt? Oh, I it was more. No, you didn't interrupt. Oh. No. <laughs> okay, sorry. Um, so this is something, and I feel free to, to jump in on this. I know that this is something that um, we have also been looking at through TLEC um, and at MALDEF and at IDRA. Um, we have, you know, encountered the reality that there is a shortage of bilingual ed teachers. Um, it has been this way for a very long time, and we know especially in rural areas, it's difficult to attract and to retain bilingual ed teachers. Um, we have saw last legislative session that there were bills filed um, that, you know, in an attempt to, um, in an attempt to get bilingual ed teachers to these um, areas that, you know, really need them, um, that there have been, you know, bills filed to sort of um, make salary supplements or to change the funding mechanism for them. But we know that that doesn't work. What we need to do is really focus on, right, the certification. So there's programs such as the Grow Your Own Teacher program um, that we have long advocated for um, that would help us fill the bilingual ed teacher shortage. And then there's also something that MALDEF um, is really, um, you know, interested in pursuing, and that's how do we get Texans, regardless of immigration status, whatever it may be, access to professional licenses? So whether that's teacher certification or that is being, you know, licensed by um, the state bar, um, you know, there's a slew of state licenses. Um, and so there's different avenues which we can work on that. Um, you know, if anybody would like to discuss that further, please feel free to contact uh, me at MALDEF or um, Ana Ramona at IDRA because we are really interested in working on the bilingual ed teacher shortage. So we'll continue to advocate for bills that would um, you know, continue to fund programs like the Grow Your Own Teacher program and looking for, um, you know, ways that we can expand professional licenses to this population, whether they are foreign born or, um, you know, for some reason they're encountering some sort of barrier to getting their teacher certification. Yeah, I would join off there. Oh, sorry. Um, I was just going to ask, what about expanding scholarships for bilingual ed uh, teachers? You know, people who want to go in there, more scholarships yeah. and maybe some loan forgiveness or something. We gotta be creative, that's all. I agree with everything you've said. Exactly, and to speak a little bit on, uh, so IDRA did work on an accelerated teacher certification model uh, through multiple projects serving Texas and was funded by the US Department of Education. Um, over a 15 year period, this program operated in 55 school districts and we recruited and prepared over 80 recent graduates, 800 recent graduates, excuse me. Um, and so this Grow Your Own program, and then also like what Senator Menendez just mentioned, some supplemental and directing TA to help kind of figure out where these issues and concerns are, um, are is so crucial into the, and to making sure that we're acquiring these teachers, especially now. So, and I would say this, we, we do have an education practice team at IDRA, so I'm happy to connect any of the ISDs directly with them to try to work through some of these as well. No, thank you, Anna. And yeah, of course, whatever information that you can do or that you guys have, forward it to MOSBA so we can also share it with the rest of the member uh, assemblies, districts that we have in our organization. That would be great. Um, right now, I think we only have about three minutes left, but just really quick, um, uh, for the sake of time, I will ask one last question and then have our sponsor uh, give a last few words here and really quick would you with a pandemic happening and you know minimizing uh, in presence to the Capitol for advocacy purposes I've been at the Capitol advocating for public ed and everything what are the most effective ways we can advocate uh, for our students superintendents school boards throughout Texas through this unique legislative session during a pandemic and just trying to see what, what is the most effective way we can, um, you know, advocate and, and reach, you know, the, the decision makers. So, um, okay, I'll I, go I, first. I just want to hear from our representative, from, from our Senator representative. <laughs> but um, I mean, what, what I've been telling folks um, across the state um, are really just, um, making sure that you're contacting your local legislators, that they know who you are, that you're providing data on your needs, your challenges, your successes of what's going on, um, and doing that regularly and not to forget staff. Staff is really important. 
Luis can testify to that. <laughs> um, they, they're really important because uh, sometimes you can't reach your member, but um, but just you should have already been contacting them. But if you haven't, start now. So we have TASB as a resource, Maldef, IDRA, and our, our representatives here that can um, we, we have as resources to be able to advocate better during this unique uh, legislative session. <laughs> and we'll be bugging you guys. <laughs> so um, real uh, quick, um, we're going to have, go ahead, uh, Senator. I was going to say Mary was about to say something. I wanted to hear what Mary had to say. And then Mary. <laughs> you like to put me on the spot. Thank you, Senator, for uh I, I, I appreciate your wisdom, Mary. Oh, I appreciate yours. I, um, no, I, I think you know Dax was a, was correct. I will say this: um, being strategic and intentional in frequent communication. So I think one mistake that is commonly made is I'll tell somebody will tell me something once, but I tell people as 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 hard as we all try as legislators, there are a million issues specifically in this session, and we are. Living Limited with staff, like I'm at 50% capacity in my office, so don't feel bad about bugging us again. We are all trying to do our best job. I tell myself all the time, compassion, grace, is, and grace is really important. So just bug us because we genuinely, at least with the folks I know, care about the issues. It just there's a lot of issues in this moment. So help us be the best legislators we can be by reaching out frequently and strategically. So uh, the only so thing I'll add, board I, trustees. Yes, school board trustees. Yeah, the only thing I would add is, is many of us are doing uh, local communication efforts. Like we have a weekly, we call it Capital Connection. Thursdays at 5.30, it's a Zoom where everyone's invited. It's open to the public. You can come in and ask whatever you want, make your statement, do whatever you have. All my team's on there. So we share how to c communicate with each other through email, social media, et cetera. And, and it's it's just an open platform where we try to provide updates and we gather information. Just focus on how to communicate with your legislators and then what everybody else said, talk to their staff over and over until they say, yes, we understand, it's a prioritized, prioritize too. I mean, it can't everything can't be a priority because if it is, then nothing's a priority. So prioritize and, and I think that that's the key. That's the key and then once, look for champions. That's the th other thing is once you've taken care of one of your priorities, you got a champion, then take the other one and look for another champion. And so you divide the work so not everyone's trying to do everything that you're interested in. Divide and conquer. Yes. So um, I want to thank everyone for being here with us um, out of your busy day, especially our elected officials here. This is very uh, important conversation and um, to all our attendees, this is also being recorded. So later on, we will be uh, providing the YouTube uh, video for this webinar. Now, um, I would like to bring on our sponsor, uh, O'Hanlon, Demereth and Castile for their words. And this is uh, Kevin O'Hanlon. And then um, after that, we will invite, we will be uh, getting our next webinar. We have eight more left. And um, our next week's webinar, we're gonna have uh, Xavier Herrera of Stafford IS, M MSD will host our conversation with our sister organization, Thalas, the Texas Association of Latino Administrators and Superintendents. The conversation moderated by Thalas president, Dr. Rick Lopez of Garland ISD, and um, Dr. Priscilla Canales of Weslaco ISD, Dr. Michael Cardona of San Marcos CISD, Dr. Selena Estrada uh, Thomas of Hutto ISD, Dr. Ro Roland Hernandez of Corpus Christi ISD, and Dr. Veronica Vigil of Fabens ISD. So we still have a, a, we have a very packed schedule the next eight weeks. And um, once again, thank you for all our panelists and um, for joining us this this uh, webinar session. Kevin, would you like to say some words, please? Thank you. I just want to, just want to say thanks for coming. Uh, this is a big session. Uh, it's going to be real important to uh, uh, the future of the kids that we're all trying to represent. So I appreciate everybody's time and attention to this. Uh, next two years is going to be governed by this. It's going to be 
uh, tough road to hoe. We need to all work together. Yeah, no, absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Kevin, for sponsoring our very important webinar we had today. We had some great panelists and a lot of great information. So um, with that being said, I think we'll be done and see you guys next Monday uh, at noon Central Standard Time. Thank you, Kevin.